And uh, welcome to everybody. And before I introduce our esteemed guest, Brenda, I want to invite you all again to put in your information into the chat because we are also about connecting with folks and networking. And uh, I'll, again, my name is Susanna Erler, and I am one of the co-organizers of TechSoup Connect Texas, and I'm your host today, uh, your local host. And today's event is titled, Making Nonprofits More Effective, The Role and Benefits of Sustained Collaboration Networks. But before I start, uh, we're going to talk for a second about our local chapter, and I am going to share a quick share screen slide that Carolyn made and uh, so that I can tell you just a little bit more about our local chapter. Here it is. Hopefully it will share great and I'll be able to, I know you, you're seeing more than you need to right now, but as soon as I click on that presentation mode, then voila. All right, this is us. This is our hashtag. Uh, we are, as Lee, Eli mentioned, part of the tech clubs around the nation and the world, and all programs are free. Uh, we are managed by a group of volunteers, and uh, hint, 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 if you have some extra time, we would love to have you as a volunteer. And this, these are the presentations we made this year, and we're looking forward to next year. Uh, we have become the Texas chapter. That's a recent new thing. So our scope is broadening. Stay tuned for that. Click, uh, here's how you can connect with us on LinkedIn. Beautiful little slide action there. And we salute Capital Factory because they've been a wonderful Austin sponsor. Yay, thank you. And here is, if you wanna take a screenshot of that, how that is how you can find the club, the group, the chapter online. And I've also put that into the chat. And thanks again, Carolyn, for making this beautiful slideshow. I will now escape and unshare. I'll stop the share. And now we're back. OK, so um, thanks for, for watching all that and sharing your information into the chat. And let's get started today. Making nonprofits more effective, the role and benefits of sustained collaboration. Our guest today is Brenda Coleman Beatty. She's the CEO of To Thrive For, a national business strategy consulting company that provides services for private and public sector organizations. She specializes in helping organizations navigate operational and financial challenges. Her work includes interim executive management, board development and training, strategic and business plans, as well as organizational assessments. Brenda has a bachelor's in international relations from Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, and a master's in Latin American studies from the University of Texas at Austin. Her civic engagement includes work with Austin Together, Leadership Austin, and the New Philanthropists, and more. She is an active advocate for head-to-toe healthcare and has, as such, been a part of uh, working with the Dell Medical School, the Texas Council for Developmental Disabilities, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, Central Texas, Integral Care, and more. And related to today's presentation, uh, based on her years of experience as a national and local executive and consultant, Brenda is going to share details today from her sustained collaboration training, coupled with hands-on experience leading and navigating an organization through COVID-19, including details about how it sharpened her knowledge about collaborations. This sustained collaboration experience helps Brenda has helped Brenda provide con consultation services more effectively and thoughtfully to organizations who, through collaboration, strive for continued excellence and who want to have more meaningful impact in their communities. So now it's my great pleasure to welcome our guest, Brenda 
Coleman Beatty. Let's give our best hands welcome to Brenda. Thank you so much, Susanna. And when you approached me over six months ago, I was like, yeah, I can do that in December. And here we are. Uh, I thank each of you for being here this evening. Tis the season to be overwhelmed, engaged, and full of commitments. And uh, Susanna, I want you to pick my lottery numbers because you said, Brenda, normally five to nine people show up, but 24 hours VP. So your numbers are pretty correct in terms of the lottery. So pick my numbers and tell me when I should play, okay? So thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm going to do a screen share, if you will, uh, to sort of kick off my uh, presentation with everyone. And so let me just ask you, um, how many of you are actually all set for the holiday? Oh, I don't see too many hands. I see a few, but not too many. Okay, so we already know what this is about, but let me just share with you the synchronistic nature of what we are talking about today in that almost a year ago to this date, I made a gift to myself. It was the one of the best gifts I've made in over a decade. And so what it was, we're all on these list serves and other things where we get this mail, say sign up for this, sign up for that. But I was experiencing a strong pet peeve relative to my prior board experience and what I was experiencing with my interim role with an organization, I'm like, you know what? There are too many nonprofits. We're all competing for the same dollars. This is in December of 2020. So you remember that was just a little bit on the other side of what we thought was, is COVID gonna get any better, right? And I'll come back to some specific examples, but we were competing with so many other nonprofits for dollars. And that's another conversation for another day about funders and how they can also facilitate us working better and being funded better and differently. But all that aside, there appeared this thing about an organization that was starting a pilot called the Sustain Collaborative or Sustain Collaboration Network Pilot. There were nearly 60 brave folks from throughout the US who said, you know what, we do this in our respective communities and or tell me more, we want to learn more. So after all my experience, which Suzanne has already talked about, I won't duplicate it, but it's always my professional goal to, if you will, sharpen the tool. So instead of staying static saying, this is the way I've done, this is the way I've been as an exec, this is the way I've consulted with and for clients, let me see how I can learn more. So that was the best gift to myself, December 2020, when I made that. We had a six-part series, which started in... Um, actually January of last year, and it was great. So it was a great gift to me. So let me fast forward. Let me just get to the, the, the crux of the matter and begin walking you through uh, some of my thoughts and, and suggestions. You know, it's a simple question, but do we ever ask ourselves if nonprofits can do better, specifically with regard to the people in the communities they serve? I believe that you know, COVID has been so traumatic on so many levels. However, I believe there have been numerable silver linings of aha moments and lessons we've learned. Now the practice is if we've learned them, are we gonna to continue to practice them and tweak and hone them? And so I'm going to share how COVID accelerated how we had no choice but to learn and do differently. And so I wanna talk about why all this matters to our community. Uh, also, uh, Rich Smalley, who is the co-founding member of the Austin Together Fund, um, is on this call as well. But this is a graphic from that website. It's actually Austin Together, not all together. But the link there, which you'll have the slide deck, does go there. So simply put, people wanna know what <laughs> is this? Hello? I don't know if that was background noise or if someone said something. Okay, keep going. What is sustained collaboration? It's basically, how do we come together as nonprofits to make a difference in our community with a real intent to have fundamental change? You know, we talk about change is good and change management, and innovation, and we have chief strategy officers and so forth, but do we really have fundamental change? And I would argue with you that I still struggle to see that among our nonprofits. We are blessed in Central Texas that we do in fact see, um, if you will, incremental change, 
but fundamental change is hard. It's a lot of work. And by the way, you will not be in everyone's fan club when you do that. So we're talking about collaboration. It makes a difference for the people we're serving. If you look at nonprofits, what is their role? What is their part in this community? And how do we continue to sharpen as nonprofits to continue to make a difference? And then I'm gonna fast forward and say this. Post the George Floyd event, you had lots of folks making comments about, oh, we're going to do this better. We're going to do that better. And I'll be honest with you, I'm going to call it out. A lot of it was window dressing. A lot of nonprofits struggled to say, okay, how are we serving the people of color when our the main portion of our boards are people who are not people of color or representative of the people we serve? So again, a lot of questions that presented opportunities for us instead of beating ourselves up. What fundamental change did we look at? And again, I, I'm real uh, fanatical about making sure I give due credit where my sources come from. So you'll see that at the bottom of most of my slides, just so you know where that comes from. So sustained collaborative is basically, how do we improve the efficiency of the services in our communities, I just said. But most importantly, and by the way, this is from the Austin Together website. Uh, how do we align services? I do a lot of organizational assessments. In fact, I've done 35 throughout the country for nonprofits and I've probably done probably close to 10 for for-profits. And I call it realignment. And sometimes that is a euphemism because some people don't want to hear that, you know, what in the heck are you doing? Let's realign, almost like a car that, you know, you wanted to run well for a period of time before you say, I'm going to buy a new one, right? So you realign it, but you also get it into balance. Likewise, Sustained collaboration for nonprofits is a similar sense of, do we ever go through other than our periodic strategic planning purposes? Do we go through and say, we need a realignment? Strategic planning, we check the boxes and say we did it. And yeah, it still goes on the shelf, but perhaps not as much. COVID has, a, a, has and so I needed, I guess, yes, in the background. Okay, was that a classic Zoom bombing? I don't know. Okay, but I'm gonna continue. I'm going to continue. So all that said and done is, aside from really being serious about fundamental changes and realigning, much like you realign a car to rebalance it, you realign, then you have to balance after you do the alignment. If you do an alignment and don't balance, uh, your car is not going to work well. Okay. Likewise with nonprofits. So Sustained Collaboration Network is the organization that supported the six-week course that I was one of the 60 cohorts that participated in that. And basically, it's a network of people who are nonprofit funders and people dedicated to making a significant but fundamental change to realign the organization. And long story short, it's getting out of short-term thinking. We think if we fix this right now, we'll band-aid it because sometimes making the hard decisions and hard choices, no one wants to go there. So we band-aid it and tell ourselves this is real change, but it's not fundamental change. So the Sustained Collaboration Network actually is a national consortium of what are seven, uh, if you will, sites that have implemented varying versions of making a difference in their respective communities. And because Austin is always on the leading edge in so many ways, the Austin Together Fund, rebranded as Austin Together, is one of those seven sites. And I'll come back to tell you how my gift to self started out with being a participant with 60 cohorts to learn about sustained collaboration to sharpen my skills that also led me to be now an advisory committee member of our local uh, sustained collaboration network, uh, Austin Together. So, you know, in the social sector, it's become cliche to say that uh, no organization can can go it alone. We often say, "Oh, I can't go it alone." I think it's uh, it's it's nice wording. It's good to say that I'm collaborative. I'm working with my community and all my other organizations. But we beat down the same doors for the same funding when we do the same programs, and we don't look at, for example, how can we stop triplicating or if there's such a word, quadruplicating our efforts and work together. Uh, 
and know that we can't do it alone. And, and I want to come to something that's just really happening right now. It's the, 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 the perfect storm accelerated by COVID. Demands for the community services, particularly since COVID, have just, just been insurmountable for a lot of organizations. Government funding is declining. Yes, we did have all forms of uh, stimulus and a case in, in point in our own community. Rental assistance funding doesn't exist anymore. Think about that domino for a lot of the health and human services and other nonprofits in our community. You know, we're really at the, the, the eye of the storm now when you look at all of those things, once that funding that was the Band-Aid got us over what we thought was a hump, but where are we now? Uh, smaller donors are giving less because their portfolios decline. Uh, and then more philanthropy is being concentrated in fewer hands. The philanthropists are saying, we're gonna join together but that means that some of our respective grantees may not overlap and be the same, another good thing. And so before the, the economic implosion, so to speak, that COVID created, uh, it was like, are we looking at resources and do we just think they're infinite or are they finite? I'm here to tell you they're finite, but we continue to want to have our organization to say that our organization is going to do it better, but John Doe's doing the same thing and saying the same thing. So again, if we combine resources and look at collective impact, there's another um, movement that actually started by the Canadians called Collective Impact, which I, if you will, become up to speed on more so as well. But collectively, can we do more and better and effectively uh, together? So one of the things uh, I wanted to share with you is there's some old data, but it's still pretty relevant. I actually checked in with Mission Capital who provided this data in 2013. I've also uh, reached out to the RGK, Bronya and George Kosmetsky Center for Philanthropy because uh, Patrick Bixler and Robert and, and Bob Springer uh, do a lot, David Springer rather, do a lot of work over there in terms of data regarding uh, Austin sustainability and nonprofits. But back in 2013, we had so many nonprofits per capita. And I'm here to tell you that number has worsened in terms of they're even more because there's so many caring and, and wonderful people. They say, I'm going to start a nonprofit for that. And of course, because of my compelling reason to exist, I'm going to get funded. And then they beat down my door and your door is a lot saying, you know what, eh, I need some money, but where can I get it? Because I'm competing with Jane Doe, John Doe nonprofits. So again, Austin, we have great heart, great talent, but we don't assess who we can do better together with, as opposed to saying, I need to start my own nonprofit. So one of the things coming full circle again to COVID, it raised some of our ugly scars. When you look at what's called the run weight, uh, run rate, if you will, if you go back to the studies that um, Mission Capital did, they did two different pulse. They took a pulse of our community, the nonprofits, pulse one and then pulse two. This is a result, one of the many from the data that show, if you will, what was happening in our community. But if you look at this, you see that 45% were saying, we need to engage in strategic partnerships with other organizations. They realized that because of that funding issue. So they were driven because funding was drying up. They weren't driven because they wanted to make collective impact and um, impact the services and the quality. It was driven by a necessity, which is, we got to do something because if we don't, then, you know, we're going to have a, a, a more challenging time than we thought we had with regard to uh, raising money. So you just look at that number. And that's from uh, May of 2020, just so you know, that 45 percent of the respondents said we need to do something differently. Uh, and that includes facing the reality of engaging with partnerships with other organizations. So collaborations tend to have a, a naughty word sometimes. People perceive that when you say you're going to collaborate, it means, oh my job, I have to tell you the truth. What people say is, I'm not gonna become a LifeWorks. For those of you who are familiar with LifeWorks in our community, you may know that it's the compendium or combination of what were 13 different nonprofits 
that then became LifeWorks. And if anyone knows Susan McDowell, who's been leading that effort over that organization for years now, if you know how much better off our community has been because those organizations woven together are having a huge impact together as opposed to 13 different organizations. And because of that, I believe LifeWorks has had a greater success rate, if you will, with uh, funders, because they see they're doing, if you will, a continuum of care that ranges from, we're gonna work with youth, getting them off the street, helping train them, helping them get their GED, helping them get housing, all the way to say, we're gonna run other programs, right? So it's not as scary as a life works. When people hear the word collaboration, nonprofits in Austin, they say, I'm not going to become a life works. I'm saying, you know what? But, but, but it's not just a life works because sustained collaboration involves demystifying that stereotype because there are a range of possibilities. You know, it could be as simple as one of the things I'll talk about specifically as it relates to this group is technology. You know what? It ranges from we're going to start conversations and see if we're going to hold hands all the way to say, are we going to get married? And then there's dating in between. First, we're going to say, we're going to hold hands, share services. Let's share some things that we don't need to duplicate. Are we going to share HR folks? Are we going to share technology support? Are we going to share what have you? In the middle, there's a lot of, well, let's inch a little bit further. We did that well. Let's see what else we can try all the way up to a full-blown joint venture or merger. So I, I continue to warn people, don't think of that as a bad word when I say collaboration, because it, it's a range of things. It's not either or, okay? So going to that point, uh, this is a great slide from the Sustained Collaboration Network, part of the training that I went through, which talks about what I just said. You know, you have alliances and networks, you have shared services. Is it co-location? Is it shared staffing? What is it all the way to a, a, a life works? Okay. So don't get scared when we talk about nonprofit collaboration because we're looking at sustaining organizations who do good work, who have impact, who can have more definitive and lasting impact, if you will, legacy impact, if in fact they look at sustained collaboration in a different sense. And it's a good exercise to go through, even if there is no marriage, you may continue to date in some form or fashion. So, you know, one of the things that um, I did these with the pop-ins and the pop-ups, I have to make sure they pop in right. Okay, so we all know that for a variety of reasons, including technology, that it is probably one of the most expensive items in addition to staff. Staff salaries usually consume the largest percent because that's what produces programs. That's what manages programs. That's what, if you will, uh, helps us sustain the good work that we're doing in our community. But it's also technology is an area where you can look at what are the opportunities for collaboration that makes it affordable and allow us to hire the people to do programming while we share the cost of certain services, okay? So you guys know this well, right, Carolyn? I think you were probably there on the front end with what were called the circuit riders. This was when the Nonprofit Technology Enterprise Network, N10, came together. It started out by saying, how do we as nonprofit technology folks work with grantors and grantees? So technology, well, maybe you didn't anticipate that you were gonna be on the forefront really of sustained collaboration, but in a different way. And there are many more prospects and opportunities. So this is a history which many of you as, as members already know about, but I've had to put that slide to give you some credit because you were perhaps ahead of your time. And I think there's even more need and, and spaces and places for the technology piece of what this group does. So let me get to the point of, of, of the technology, but leading up to that, let's talk about the runway. So also another thing that um, Mission Capital did as part of their survey results, they went through a process to say, okay, nonprofits, and this is roughly about 200 of them that participated in this particular um, survey. Uh, not Mission Capital said, how much operating money do you have? So if you got no, not a penny or a dime more in the door today, how long could you go? And on average, and not so much average, but the, the median, if you will, was four to six months for nonprofits. And there were very few 
they could go more than a year and about a fourth they could go up to a year. So that again presented some real hard data that showed us that, okay, that runway for a lot of organizations mm, is a little bit scary and we're all competing for the same dollars. And after COVID, what's that gonna look like? Such that do we need to look at sustained collaboration and the gamut of what it can be as a possible alternative to manage our cost and do better and more effectively for the people we serve in this community. So I have a curiosity poll that I'm gonna have uh, Susanna help me with, which she's gonna put in the chat uh, a question. And it really is my curiosity and it's fed by uh, what I've experienced with the organization I was the former interim executive director for and the current one, which is uh, what I call the customer relationship management or CRM software. I want to know what has been your experience as an employee or as a consultant to a nonprofit with regard to CRMs. And we all know what that is. It's a technology platform that many people use to do a lot of things. And what I have continued to learn is that sadly, it's underutilized in our community because a lot of folks will use it for the sake of saying that they have that, as I call it, Lexus, and they realize once they get the Lexus that the maintenance is really high. For those of you who have a Lexus, which is a great vehicle, you know, when you take it in for its periodic maintenance, it ain't cheap. You know, it starts at a minimum of $500 just to so we're going to hook you up to the computer and then more things need to happen. But at the same time, I, I'm curious as to whether a Corolla would be equally a good fit, a Toyota Corolla or Camry. By the way, I don't sell cars, but I like to use that 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 compare and contrast just to say to have a Lexus fully loaded is great, but it's high maintenance and can nonprofits afford it relative to their utilization. But does a Corolla or does a Camry work as well? So Suzanne was gonna put in the chat a couple of questions I had out of curiosity. And since we're a small group, maybe you can shout out some of your answers. And I'm just curious uh, by show of hands, how many of you, so Carolyn, did you have a question? Well, I have uh, definitely some experience uh, working with nonprofits and um, they have CRMs that they've acquired uh, and basically no one's taking any time with it. And I have uh, in the past few years gotten with one group that had a Z2 Neon, perfectly fine, reasonably priced, not the most expensive razor's edge kind of thing perfectly fine platform. And um, so I did spend a lot of time on it. I took it apart and put it back together because I'd say a half of the names uh, on there, in there and the data was wrong, people were gone. And so, but what was going on at the same time is siloing within the organization. And so we had the program people that just had their Excel spreadsheet for their, constituents and they just that's it they were not ever going to learn the z2 neon so anyway i cleaned it up and then i presented it back to him i mean it took months to do that and updated it so it was really strong and then it hooked into our mailchimp so everything was really coordinated and working well and by the time i was done i worked with that group for about a year and by the time I was done, they they just still, the board was asking them, the staff to use it. And they just refused to take the time and they kept siloing. Well, I've got mine over here, you know, <laughs> I couldn't get them. And to so that. Carolyn, I wanna thank you for sharing that because what I have experienced, but more data will show, I think, exactly what you said, but that's my curiosity because I suspect that's more of the case than the exception in our community, which leads me to something that I'm just putting out there, which is, you know, there's a, you guys may be familiar with business software.com. Uh, they put out just two weeks ago, a 2020 edition. By the way, I don't endorse them. I'm just sharing data that's available, but they looked at the top 40 services compared to Salesforce. Mm -hmm. So my whole point here from a technology standpoint of how you as an employee or a consultant to a nonprofit can look at, do you look at the range of options for your organization or do you have them lead you down the path to say, I want the Lexus, 
I know a Corolla may be great, but the Lexus is what I'm told everybody's using. So I just put that out there because in terms of sustained collaboration, there's so many organizations that go to Carolyn's point that have some aspect of the silo. And if they're going to keep Salesforce, how are they integrating that to be more effective tool, tool being the keyword for how they function as an organization? But what data are they gleaning from that to improve the impact of their organization? So as a, as a technology consultant or as a nonprofit employee, what are you doing to support saying, let me do some sniffing to see what other organizations are out there where we can share the consultant costs or the cost of managing and maintaining Salesforce, if that's possible, by the license, as opposed to duplicating your costs, which is draining your budget for something you don't use and you don't get the data out of. I can tell you this, I've run uh, multi-million dollar capital campaigns using Excel spreadsheets and Microsoft tables and charts. And I do tell them, I finally say, look, you can do it. What's really required for technology like that data management platforms is the person using it, persons using it, are fully engaged with it, understand it, and actually document what they're doing and who they're talking to and what the addresses are and whatever information that's in there. So I guess I would say, I think nonprofits feel they're trapped into, I have to have this expensive CRM and they don't because if you're never going to use it, I have seen another large, I worked with another really large nonprofit and they had Razor's Edge Deluxe. They had the Lexus, you know, they had the Rolls Royce. No one was using it. 50, at yeah. that time it was 50,000. I'm sure it's more expensive today. A and year. so what I'm trying to do is to put this ball in your court as consultants in nonprofit organizations, because more data from Mission Capital Survey from May of 2020. Look at it. What type of collaboration are, opportunities are you looking for? And it's technology and digital access. Digital access for the people they serve, many people of color or people in lower income socioeconomic communities, the technology going to the point that I'm trying to make that I hope is relevant for this group in terms of why you exist. Yes, you can do the tech, tech soup package, but what are you using to drive it? What are the systems underneath and supporting it and staff. And again, it's low hanging fruit. It's perhaps the easiest way to start holding hands with an organization towards the path of even discussing collaboration of any kind. But you can see the data show that technology was the number one thing of 221 nonprofits that said, you know what, we need to do something. And again, technology and digital access. Um, another study that just came out recently that Rich is, is familiar with as well is C, as in the ocean sea change. They're based up in the Northeast, but they work predominantly as one of the seven sustained collaboration networks in the country. Uh, they put out a primer on nonprofit collaboration. And you'll see, and I highlighted the number one, well, one of the high challenge, uh, challenges, a common challenge is, is the IT integration. Again, going back to what Carolyn has said, going back to what I've seen. So there's a niche that whether it's through, oh gosh, I hadn't thought of it that way, or I hadn't pushed the envelope from a collaboration perspective, meaning as the IT support, IT consultant, have you looked at organizations to say, on behalf of the organization I'm consulting to or an employee of, am I doing my due diligence to say, I'm here for the mission and why we exist and how can we look at if in fact there's synergies with other nonprofits like us, because that's that's a huge issue on, on any level as well in terms of organizational effectiveness. Brenda, I was just gonna say ROCA, R-O-C-A in California, which serves youth offenders in the justice yes. system. If you, uh, I saw one of the finest uh, programs on use of technology, smart, integrated, breaking down silos, it was during a social solutions conference a couple of years ago. And so if you ever, I'm just telling you, they were so, so uh, smart and really a nice group of people. So I would just say that was good. Braille Society is another one. Very, Thank you very for nice. sharing that. And if you could put it in the chat, that'll be helpful too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm calling this slide the real deal about sustained collaborations. It's not all apple pie a la mode with the nuts and cherries on top. It begins internally and comes from a, a, a source of strength. So it's a strengths-based, based, constructive, positive approach, but it is a hard one when you look at EDs, 
when you look at board leadership, because we're all used to in the nonprofit role of saying, I've paid my dues as an ED and by darn, I'm not gonna end in a musical chair without a chair. And when you're a board who's been a significant donor or you're driven by the mission, or in some cases responsible for creating the organization, you're like, oh my God, does that mean that my identity, my baby goes away? So there's some co common challenges that, that are there to begin handholding, let alone dating, let alone a marriage. And then there are tons of things you need to do. But one of the unintended but good consequences of collaboration that has been post-COVID and post-George Floyd is that it does enhance the opportunity because the bottom line is people look at the impact of people impacted by COVID. The people impacted were a lot of people of color. Everybody was impacted by COVID, no denial but people of color, the digital divide among other things. And so it was a wake up call for people to say, oh, wow. So there's some form of collaboration because I don't have all the tech money or the tech staff. Can we collaborate and do something that in many cases serve populations that overlap between our organization? What can we collaborate on? And then do those discussions lead to other forms of collaboration? Again, I'm trying to pitch the point that sometimes it's starting out small as opposed to we're gonna go all in, which may be appropriate for many organizations, but to gear from the scare factor, let's look at something that's very utilitarian that everyone's trying to, to solve. So I have to talk about my favorite because here a year ago, I started with my training through the National Sustained Collaboration Network. And little did I know that another gift would be in April of this year, 2021, that I was invited to be uh, a member of the committee uh, of the Austin, the advisory committee of the Austin uh, Together, formerly known as the Austin Together Fund, because it does fund based upon um, uh, an application and a deliberation and so forth, uh, implementation, and then from there perhaps uh, feasibility first and then perhaps implementation of a collaboration, okay? So it was created in 2019. Uh, again, it's one of seven national, um, if you will, networks throughout the country, but it really has made a difference in this community. I'm biased, but I've seen it. I've, I've experienced it as an advisory committee member being part of uh, those arrangements of, of handholding and maybe we're gonna date kind of things that are confidential until such time as they're done, whatever form or fashion they're done in. But if you go to the website, which the link is in this slide as well, you'll see that um, for the first two years, so in two years, 27 grants to 40 organizations to look at how do we look at whether it's even feasible for us to do some form of collaboration, okay? And then we have an ambitious goal to look at 50 more collaborations over the next three years. So it's no eagles at the door in terms of this, this advisory committee. It's pure heart of people saying, we know our community is doing great stuff, but we know it can do even better. And I think probably one of the biggest highlights that you'll see on the webpage when you go to it is what I'll call uh, the Greater United Way for our community, where United Way of the Capital Area, as we know it, is, has now, if you will, merged with, or if you want to think of it in reverse, United Way of Williamson County is now part of United Way of the Capital Area. So if you think about it, it really is United Way of Central Texas. And so that was one of the, if you think about it, uh, sustained collaboration networks, the Austin Together uh, organization was integral in bringing to the table to help them start dating and holding hands and providing them with guides to help them with knowledge and expertise going through this process. So we have something in our front yard that's a great example of how sustained collaboration can work and does work. And, and also I'm gonna go to the next slide, which says, you know, it's not a, a universal solution sustained collaboration, it, not, it may not be the end all be all for all organizations. But what I do want you to have is resources in my being respectful of the time and maybe having some dialogue before we end in 10 minutes is giving you a couple of resources to go take a look at. The sustained uh, collaboration has a report that came out. So this is the link here in the deck that you'll get that has the full report. Uh, you have even within the Austin Together uh, website, we have a link to a great article that talks about management services, a la technology services, if you will. And then Carolyn and, and Susanna, you're probably familiar with the recent article in November, I believe, 
uh, talking about time and expense best practices for nonprofits looking to thrive. And it talks about those kinds of services. And then uh, Mission Capital also has the uh, digital equity resources on its page. So one of the things I do, I don't love reinventing or creating something for the sake of putting my name on it. My thing is we have resources that tell us a lot of things, a lot of data, a lot of uh, things that are saying other people have done this research. But my pet peeve is what have we done to bring it together to then go forward to have fundamental change impact and effective nonprofits in our community. Lots of data exists. And then the last one, I think I provided the, the link to the CRM top 40, which is yes, the Lexus Salesforce, some may think uh, is there, but there are others. Again, I don't endorse that. It's just a resource with information that through a simple Google search, I provided for you guys who are consultants specifically and, and, and in-house staff too, from an IT perspective to have uh, to look at. And so with that in mind, I'm going to end, and if you will, uh, be more conversational with you while you're still here, because you may have questions or even examples from your own front yard or backyard that you'd like to share. Thank you, Brenda. And uh, before we give Brenda a hand, I, I note that Alan has shared some information about the use of a CRM at your nonprofit or nonprofits. Would you like to unmute yourself and describe it? Uh, yes, hi, thank you for that presentation. Great insight and very necessary in these times. Um, for our second non, we have two nonprofits. Uh, one of them, we're not even gonna look for funding. We're gonna keep it 100% volunteer because we have so much energy and people around it. We have the mayor, we have the city council who's done it in their district, you know, with, 500 bucks. So it was done very people-centric participatory. We have five Alamo colleges and the chancellor. And so we're putting it, ingraining the building of that nonprofit through volunteer, through coursework as part of curriculum and sociology, political science, IT. So it's a beautiful program. We don't want any money in it because it's a very revolutionary program. It actually, uh, it's almost like a parallel government participatory budgeting. And we're kind of sneaking it into high schools all over Texas. And so it's just not gonna be uh, vulnerable to administrative uh, harassment from any, whether it's state, city government, federal. I used to be a federal investigator. So I can tell you a lot of things, uh, nefarious qualities of different organizations. That one's gonna be untouchable. It's 100% volunteer run under the Alamo colleges. The nonprofit, uh, the second one is VR therapies and we manufacture the product, manufacturing 3000 of them. So it's a product that we sell. And so we tried going through foundations since last year when we started production and we had people in foundations telling us they thought it was like a sleeping. They didn't know what VR was. We had actually the first interview we had from Foundation. They thought it was a, a blue light that would help you sleep coming out of the headsets we manufactured. There's just a mobile phone, mobile VR. So we're like, no, it's not a blue light that shines on you to sleep. It actually is a virtual world in it. So obviously that was a big opener. Nobody knows what VR is how we use it in hospitals, how we work with nurses unions. So we're like, this is a waste of time. We're just applying to these hundreds of applications, it's not going anywhere. So anyway, we're, we have enough funds to manufacture and to distribute our headsets. So we're not really bothering with donors. We sell a product to children's hospitals specifically. And uh, we work with the Mayo Clinic, which is the number one hospital in the country. So we're not even a, but we gave up. I mean, we had a year of, app, of applying. We're just like, this is, uh, this is too innovative and not tested enough. <clears throat> so it just didn't work as a product that could be sold to uh, donors. Even if uh, we would sneak into like, into competitions or win competitions like, uh, and then they want, you know, equity. And we're like, we're a nonprofit, you can't purchase us. And so that was just for fun. We'd sneak into these competitions, but, but yeah, we're good on that. I think it's just, uh, we would love to have more collaboration with other peoples. 
we have a lot of organizations like the Valor Program. So we, we put our headsets inside of uh, veterans coming out of jail. They get a backpack with toiletries and things like that. It's a program very successful here, here in Texas. So a lot of diff different collaborative models that we have. <clears throat> if anybody knows any programs like that, that they'd like to do therapies in VR, we manufacture our headsets for under seven bucks, sell them for 25, and we donate for each sale. We're donating a thousand to a nurses union. So that's how we work it. Um, but we'd love to collaborate any nonprofit doing work with vulnerable populations since our model was developed for refugees, uh, refugee camps specifically. And so, yeah, anything collaborative, anyone in Texas, we'd love to work with them. And Thank you. Yeah. So if there's anybody in the group that has an idea for collaborating with uh, Alan, thanks for describing the organizations. And Alan, your description um, dovetails into a question I, I heard you ask, but I want to also spotlight it. Um, I think part of part of what you were saying, I heard you say, is how do you start um, say holding hands or you know moving that would be my question for you brenda is um how how would how does it look i i know that you said that people uh, you know it might come from a place of power the person or the entity that has has the power might make it happen but in examples that you've seen what is it like a board member is talking to another board member and they brainstorm and how do, how do you see step one to step two happen that's a very good question and so there are various ways that takes place but i have to tell you in my experience the most successful ones is when you have executive directors come to the table and the executive directors you have those who are mature enough and not worried about ending up without a musical chair so the agenda is very different the agenda is about the community and the mission driven and the impact and then they in turn work with their executive committee and and then over time with their entire board about this hand holding in particular in particular dating process and then maybe a marriage um, and then they engage us in Austin, for example, Central Texas, that is, um, with the uh, Austin Together Fund. We provide guides who help them through that process, help them navigate. But it really starts in the most successful ones, in my opinion, with the executive directors. When it's board driven, it's um, interesting. It does and can happen. But I have found them to be interesting and more challenging. And does Austin Together ever ever take the first step or is it sometimes yeah. Uh, okay yeah, well, yeah so just... so for example there are situations where we will reach out to organizations and say hey have you two three whatever ever thought about xyz a shared service or a relationship can we facilitate that conversation and uh, oftentimes people say yeah let's talk about that and some will say yes let's explore that further and if they say, okay, we think we want to submit a proposal to Austin together for us looking at the feasibility of this even happening. And by the way, all feasibilities don't turn out to be, we're going to do it a lot too, not all. Um, and so, yes, we planned, uh, we sometimes are, are matchmakers or match.com, I guess, if you want to look at a parallel. That's great, the great analogy. Carolyn, Carolyn. Uh, for Alan, I was on my phone searching while listening to your talk. Uh, Capital Factory has a health tech startup kind of a group. Yeah, it says it's a new partnership about just a few minutes old. Two divisions of Chicago-based healthcare services corporation are teaming up with Capital Factory to connect emerging technology solutions with members and clients. C1 Innovation Lab, a Dallas-based center to incubate and develop new products along with the division of Blue Cross Blue Shield are working with the Austin based accelerator, but um, they basically hold meetings on health uh, tech. And so that's one uh, outcome of it. But I think if you uh, got with Capital Factory and ask about their health tech uh, program, that, that might be good to uh, just get some ideas and brainstorm. It's called yeah, health, health techs. I hate to even say this right now. 
Health Tech Austin meeting is Monday, December 6th at 7.28 right now. Mm -hmm. It's meeting, uh, I guess, at Capitol Hill. <laughs> Same well, time as we ask, but Let me ask before people get interested in that one. Danita and Dale, do either of you have questions for, for me or for the group? Yes, yes I did. Um, thank you for that. Uh, oh, can you hear me? Okay. I, I I have been going in and out. My computer doesn't love me right now, I guess, but nonetheless. So my question has to do with the way that you were speaking about nonprofits that are currently in existence, where you say, you know what, it would be great if you just sort of walk down this road and perhaps want to have some level of, of um, maybe just exploring the interest. Um, between coming together. So I love that premise. I would like to see it more for nonprofits that are, as you spoke earlier, were saying, hey, let's, I'll just start one. <laughs> because what ends up happening is um, we, we don't know this road that we're going to travel. <laughs> until we're on this journey. And it's, it's sort of like, sometimes you go, wait, I want off this ride. because <laughs> It just is very challenging to navigate, but it's still fun. You're serving the community, you're doing your calling and your ministry or your, your, your passion or what have you. But I would love some words of wisdom that I can borrow <laughs> so I can share with others because I get asked all the time about starting a nonprofit. Um, I work with students. I work with a lot of youth. We do youth development. And so they're thinking that it's this thing where you just sort of go in the community and you just are going to get a gazillion dollars. And I'm like, no, honey, that stuff gets started out of somebody's wallet, <laughs> namely probably yours or mine, you know, <laughs> or whatever the case. And things start, you know, sort of picking up maybe a little bit if somebody sees some interest, but nothing is guaranteed. So what are your words of wisdom to encourage some of these young people that maybe they might want to do this partnership or exploration or what have you? Danita, that is an excellent question. Let me share with you something that's so easy to do. You know, when we put the word business in any term, nonprofits say, oh, you mean the bad word business? No, every organization is a business. Where I'm going with that is, when you have an organization, nonprofit included, we always focus on the strategic plan, but there's also a business plan. How do you exist? Why do you exist? So for anyone interested in starting a nonprofit like starting a business, have you done your homework? Meaning who are your competitors? Who has and is doing what you want to do? Real basic work. Yes, you have the passion. You want to do this. You know you will do it uniquely. I know you will because it's you. Only you can be you. However, have you done your homework? So the question is asking, it's not just young people, by the way. I know others of all ages, if you will, who say, I'm going to start this nonprofit. And my first question is, have you checked out? Have you done your homework? Like a SWOT analysis, which used to be the go-to, your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Who's your competition? And what are they doing? And how are they doing it differently? Or how will you do it differently? Because when you go to a funder, I would hope you would distinguish yourself saying, fund me, because this is how I'm different. Or go to that, quote, competitor and say, you know what, this is the niche or the strength I have to leverage and balance your strength. Why don't we do this together? Simply doing your homework. Who else is doing what I'm hoping to do? And the data is out there for, from a variety of sources. Great. Danita, Thank do you, you have a follow-up? Danita, oh, okay, great. Yeah, I was, gonna, I was wondering if you had any follow-ups for Brenda. Um, Danita, but um, oh, I have tons of them, but I'm I'm um, absolutely respectful of your time, so I'm going to reach out to Miss Brenda directly <laughs> because I don't want to hold you here all night. <laughs> well, well I tell you, you what, why don't we hear one question from Dale, and then we'll let Susanna wrap up. How about that, Dale? We've seen your beautiful smile. Why don't you share a question or a comment? Thank you. Yeah, um, I am. Um, I do consulting, but, uh, but my primary focus is accounting for nonprofits uh, using QuickBooks. That's my little niche. And uh, I see two, two organizations that uh, 
possibly could work together. And um, one has good city funding and one is too new to the community to do that. And um, I'm thinking, you know, hey, I should mention something like this, but I don't know what, are, you know, do I send an email with this slide show or uh, you know what you can do to somebody? You can, Dale, you can say, you know what? I attended this, this quick session on Monday night that. and let yeah. me share what I heard. And if they're in our Central Texas community, Dale, you can, for example, refer them to the Austin Together website, which the links are in the slides, which I'll provide that slide deck to Susanna. So they can see specifically what's happening in our community, how we do it, why we do it. And if they want to talk to me, again, it's all confidential. We never say who we're talking to or why, other than until it becomes public, like the United Way example I gave you. But you can just tell them you heard about this and say, hey, had you checked this out? Do you want to talk to Brenda? Because she shared some of her thoughts about it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. In fact, I started an email to one of the EDs. <laughs> say, I, I want you to see the slideshow when it comes up. But just Austin together, making sure she knows about you guys. Thank and you. Yeah, and put y'all put your emails in the chat if you haven't already. And that way, when Brenda says, sends me the slides, I can get them to you, you all. And um, yes, we're at uh, almost 740. And so what I want to do is, first of all, say thank you so much to Brenda Coleman Beatty for your wonderful presentation, your knowledge, your, the, the excellent presentation that you did. We're so grateful. Uh, thank you all to you for coming today and please keep in touch with us. Um, the emails and the URLs and everything are in the chat. Don't forget to save the chat. And with that, I'm going to applaud Brenda and I'm going to stop the recording and, and 